Low Earth orbit satellites are revolutionizing satellite communications. So let's take a brief look at the communication challenges in designing LEO satellite networks. We're going to look at five topics, constellations, coverage, beam steering, networking, and the physical waveform. Let's start with constellations. And here's a picture of the Earth. And the first thing to know about LEO satellites is that they fly around the Earth at a much faster rate than the Earth is spinning. And this is different from geostationary satellites, which stay over a fixed point of the Earth and rotate with the Earth. So for LEO satellites, one of the constellations you can have is a polar constellation. So in this case, if this is the Earth here, you can imagine a satellite flying around the Earth at a speed which is roughly speaking, depends on the altitude of the satellite, roughly speaking 90 minutes to travel all the way around the Earth. And if we were to draw the line on the Earth that the satellite flies over, for that one there that I'm showing here that's in the plane of the page, then that line would be the black line that's shown. Other orbits, of course, could be at different lines of longitude. So, for example, one could come out of the page, fly towards us around the Earth and go down at the South Pole and back up the other side. And that satellite path, if I drew it on the Earth, would look like this. But of course, we can have other lines of longitude as well. So other, others might be like this. If I draw in some of these other potential paths, for the orbits of different satellites. And so if you have multiple satellites, you can cover the Earth in this way. One problem with this polar constellation is that the satellite spends quite a bit of time at the North Pole and the South Pole, where there is no or very few human population. And so if you're wanting to use your satellites for communication purposes, you want them to be more efficiently covering the areas of the globe where people are living. So one thing you can do there, instead of a polar constellation, another thing you could do is to tilt the angle. And we call that an inclined constellation or an inclined uh, axis of the orbit. And so let me draw one, for example, here, if it was inclined to the left. So instead of this vertical one here, for example, we change the orientation. So here would be the line on the Earth that an inclined axis would uh, fly over. Of course, we don't just have to uh, think about inclining to the left because it's a three dimensional circle, of course. Uh, and so if we inclined the same inclination, but to the right, then we would have this orbit here. So we can have uh, two different satellites, one on this inclination with this um, rotation and another one with this inclination here. Of course, we don't have to have just those two of left and right tilts. We can tilt towards and away, and it doesn't have to be at sort of 90 degree angles as well. So I'll draw another one in here, for example, uh, which would be uh, if it was tilted towards us and to the left, it would be an, a rotation like this. Hopefully you can visualize that. There'd be another one if it was towards us and to the right, then it gets to its maximum around here. And so this one would have an orbit that looks like this, for example. And of course, you can have them going to the back where they are tilted to the back, and then they're going to come up uh, underneath the uh, from the bottom and have an orbit that looks like this. So if I can sort of draw this accurately, fairly accurately here. And then there's another one that will be coming in like this. And of course, you can have any other different uh, inclinations, different tilts towards to the left or to the right. And what you can see now is there's a maximum uh, height or a maximum line of latitude that is covered by these satellites and the same thing, a minimum one at the bottom. So this inclined orbit doesn't go over the poles. It has more even coverage of the Earth's surface. Uh, and it covers the areas where the uh, human population are living more effectively. So this is going to be uh, many advantages from a polar orbit. And of course, the angle of inclination is a design parameter. So you can have very shallow angles. You'll cover less of the Earth, but you'll need fewer satellites. Uh, so this is an important design parameter, of course, in addition to the altitude of the satellites. So the altitude will also affect, of course, the paths and the time it takes to rotate around the Earth. 
Let's take a look then at coverage. We're already thinking about coverage here, but I've just been talking about a single satellite flying on a trajectory. But of course, we are going to need to have constant coverage along those trajectories, which means that each satellite needs to be followed by other satellites on the same trajectory. So for example, this trajectory which goes up through here, uh, the satellite, because it's low Earth orbit, it's not going to have the same coverage area on the Earth as a geostationary satellite has, which is much further away from the Earth. So this satellite, satellite flying on this trajectory here will need to have another satellite in front of it and another one in front of that and of course one's following so that you can have constant coverage of the Earth for, from that particular trajectory. And then each of these different trajectories here will need to have multiple satellites. So again, another parameter in this communication challenges for designing is the number of satellites. And some of these constellations have numbers ranging from in the tens up to in the thousands, even up as high as 4,000, 5,000 satellites, depending on the inclination and the amount of coverage required. Of course, the circles that I've drawn here are not exact. They are beam patterns and those beam patterns roll off. And so you're going to be getting uh, some overlapping coverage and you need to design how close you want these satellites to be for how much roll off in your design of your beam pattern. Another important element for coverage is that not every user on the ground will be directly under the satellite when it comes over. So we're going to have different elevations for different locations on the Earth. So for example, as a function of time, when the satellite flies overhead, a satellite that flies directly over the top of you, uh, if you were a user here, for example, then you're starting to get, let's say we're thinking about this satellite, you're starting to see that satellite, but it's near the horizon from where you are. Then it flies over your head and flies onto the, uh, over on the trajectory, which means that the angle of inclination for you or elevation we call it, the angle of elevation increases and then decreases as the satellite flies overhead. Of course, not every user is directly underneath the, the satellite path. So there'll be a, users here where they are on the side of the satellite as it flies over. So they are looking always at a lower inclination. So this will be uh, like this, a lower elevation. So this is uh, another important parameter when we're thinking about the communication because your uh, channel gain uh, is affected by the angle of elevation from the ground user. And so you, if that flies overhead, you're going to get a nice strong signal when it's overhead. But if you're off to the side of one of these paths, even the strongest signal will be reduced compared to someone who's directly under the flight path. Another element to be thinking about is that you have to hand over from one satellite to the next. And it might well be that you're handing over, like is drawn here, from one satellite on this plane to the next satellite on the same plane as they fly over. But it could also be that you, there are uh, weak coverage between these two satellites and you might be relying on another plane. So for example, a plane coming down. So here we can see planes coming down and planes going up. And so sometimes you want to hand over from a plane coming down to a plane coming up. And this has quite a lot of overhead in terms of making sure that that data connection is continuous from one satellite to the next. Also, the elevation of the satellites are going to change. So you might have this, uh, just drawing this picture here for a single satellite of elevation, uh, elevation here. But now when you do a handover, you might be onto a satellite that's not coming straight over your head, especially uh, also it's important to consider that the Earth is rotating underneath these satellites. So even if you're underneath a satellite that flies directly over the top of you at one satellite, by the time the next satellite comes, the Earth will have rotated a bit. And so that satellite won't be directly over top of you anymore. And certainly after uh, four or five satellites coming over, the Earth will have rotated significantly and you will be no longer getting the same um, elevation because the 
path will have shifted relative to where you are on the Earth. So this is the sorts of pictures you get as you hand over from one satellite to the next, the elevation uh, decreases. So you might have a good path gain with a high ability to have high data rates here, but at a later point in time, you have only a lower elevation with a worse channel and not so high data rates. And so you have to manage your data rates over time as low Earth orbit satellites fly overhead. Let's think also about beam steering. So getting a satellite signal from a, a, a beam that is covering uniformly on the ground below the satellite is one thing, and this is probably good enough for low data rate services. But if you want high data rate services, then you're going to need to have beams on from the satellite. And now new satellites can have electronically steered beams. So now if I draw one of those coverage maps here, so this is a circle here representing one of these coverages here, then within that circle, you'll have different users. And if you want to give them a better channel, a better gain, then you're going to direct electronic beams to them. Rather than having one beam pattern that covers the whole of footprint of the ground evenly, you're going to be able to create multiple beams towards different areas of the ground, uh, particularly, as I say, if you want to be delivering high data rate services. And what this means is, let's say, for example, you have an ability to form five beams, then you could form five beams from a single satellite within one of these coverage areas. You could form five beams like this, for example, to give users in those beam areas higher data rates, getting more energy. But of course, that means that other users who are not in those beams will not be covered for that period of time. So now you're going to have to think about hopping the beams so that you can cover all the users within the beam pattern uh, in a time shared freak, uh, beam hopped pattern. So beam steering and beam hopping is another challenge for future low Earth orbit satellites. What about networking? Well, we've so far just talked about individual satellites and assumed that when you can get a signal to them, then you are able to get the communication. But most satellites uh, to, at the moment are installed and, and operate in what we call a bent pipe mode, where the signal goes up to the satellite, uh, it gets frequency translated to the downlink frequency band, and then goes to a stationary ground station which then connects to the internet uh, for networking purposes. So let's think about that for low Earth orbit satellites, which are spinning around the Earth. That means that you need to have a lot of ground stations all around the globe. So for, in contrast to geostationary, for example, geostationary, the satellite sits at a permanent location above the Earth, spinning with the Earth, and the ground station is always visible to, or you make sure that the ground station is always visible to that satellite because the satellite is not moving relative to the Earth. But for LEO satellites that are spinning around, we need to have many, many, many more ground stations. So that is a significant communication challenge for designing a LEO network. In future, there will be satellite to satellite communications and we'll be looking to have a network in the sky. So one of the things that needed for that was what we would call onboard processing, where we can have a network, a switch in the satellite. So it's not simply doing a frequency translation, it's actually doing network packet switching in the sky. It then needs other communication technology to communicate between satellites. So you'd have antennas not just pointing at the ground for the users, but also pointing between the satellites, potentially optical links with lasers between satellites or directional millimeter wave links, forming that network in the sky with onboard processing. And the final area we want to look at in this brief summary is the physical waveform. And how is that different for low Earth orbit satellites compared to geostationary? Well, with low Earth orbit, because the satellite is moving very fast, there will be significant Doppler in the signal. And this needs to be taken account of in the physical waveform. And you might think that the Doppler can be pre-compensated because you know that the LEO satellite is flying at a constant speed. And this is true for the user who's at the center of the beam. But for users who are at other locations in the beam coverage area, 
they will not be seeing the same exact relative speed. And so the compensation will not work exactly for them. Another aspect of Doppler is the potential for Doppler spread when there's multiple paths. And in general, for geostationary satellites, we don't consider multiple paths because we have antennas on the ground that are dish antennas pointing directly at the geostationary satellite. And because they are directional, they are able to null out the multi-paths coming in from other directions. But for LEO satellites, because the satellites are flying around, you can't have a ground-based physical dish which tracks the satellite. So we need electronically steerable beams on the ground and potentially we might want to have omnidirectional users on the ground such as a portable handset. In this case we will be getting Doppler spread as well as the Doppler shift. And so uh, one thing, how does that affect our channel? Well for example it's going to make OFDM difficult. So again for more information on OFDM there's many other videos on the channel. But here for example are two of the um, uh, carriers I'm drawing here for OFDM just as an example. And when you get Doppler spread then the nulls from neighboring carriers do not align up with the peaks of the neighbors. And so they are no longer orthogonal. So OFDM is a problem when you have multiple paths and you have these, you're going to tend to have these in LEO satellites when you didn't have them in geostationary. And so one potential new exciting waveform, um, again a video on the channel uh, explains this in more detail, is called orthogonal time frequency space, OTFS. And in this case you translate, instead of from time and frequency domain, you translate into a delay and Doppler domain. And in the Doppler domain, the Doppler is relatively constant, uh, certainly in comparison to in the frequency domain, the channel changes. And the delay is constant of those paths, relatively constant on the timescales we're interested in. So if we have a waveform, which is in the delay Doppler domain, then we can be ideally suited to high Doppler scenarios, particularly for LEO satellite communication networks. So we've covered quite a range of topics here. Hopefully it's given you more insights into LEO satellite communication networks. If it has, uh, like the video, it helps others to find it. Um, subscribe to the channel for more videos and check out the description below. You'll find a website with a full categorized listing of all the videos on the channel.